Well, today we're going to watch a dramatization of a conflict of moral reasoning which led to violent and terrible consequences. And then afterwards we're going to consider some of the issues it raises. The piece is taken from Crime and Punishment, the novel by the great 19th century author Dostoevsky. The book tells the story of a young man, Raskolnikov, who commits a terrible murder. And the scene we're going to watch takes place fairly early in the book. Raskolnikov, who is contemplating doing the murder, goes into a tavern in St. Petersburg where he chances to overhear a conversation between two men, one of whom is, like himself, a penniless student. But, um, has she the resources to back it up? Oh, yeah, she's rich, all right. Rich as a Jew. If you want, she'll let you have 5,000 rubles. If you want to pawn something for a ruble, that's all right as well. Sounds a very accommodating old lady. She's a bitch. Look, she'll only let you have a quarter. One quarter of the value of anything you take in. And she charges 7% a month. I see. This dear old lady has a sister. Lizaveta. But she, she treats her like a child. Makes her do all the housework. And that child's about 35. <laughs> At least six feet tall. What an extraordinary phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really cruel, though. I mean... Elizabeth slaves away, night and day does all the cooking and sewing, and more than that, she even works as a char lady and gives everything she earns to the old woman. Sounds to me if she has an absolutely wretched life. Oh, yes. It's bizarre. Mind you, Elizabeth is really uncouth. I mean, she's... She's extraordinarily tall, and... And she's very long feet. I don't know, kind of... Point outwards. <laughs> oh, she's clean. I'll, I'll give her that. The really funny thing is, though, she's always... What? Uh, pregnant? Yeah. No, <laughs> I don't believe it. Well, she's not all that hideous. She looks very good-natured. And her eyes are quite lovely. Anyway, the proof of it is lots of men find her attractive. And she's so soft and good-natured, she'll put up with anything, anything at all. <laughs> Mind you, she really does have a very sweet smile. I think you're rather attracted to yourself. Well, perhaps. But uh, not only because she's so peculiar. Still, I'll tell you one thing. I could kill that old woman, take all her money, and not feel the slightest prick of conscience. Huh. No, seriously. I mean, on the one hand, we have a stupid, senseless, worthless, spiteful, sick, horrid old woman who isn't only useless, but is doing actual mischief. An old woman who doesn't know what she's living for and is going to die soon anyway. Yes. And on the other hand, we have fresh, young lives thrown away by the thousand every day for want of a bit of help. I could do a thousand good deeds with that old woman's money. Hundreds, thousands of people could be put on the right path. Dozens of families saved from ruin. Now, I say, kill that old woman. Take her money. And use it in the service of humanity. And don't you think that one tiny crime would soon be wiped out by a thousand good deeds? Hmm? One death for a thousand lives? Oh, come on, a bit simple arithmetic, isn't it? Besides... What is the value of that stupid old woman's life when weighed in the general good of mankind? Absolutely nothing, nothing at all. No more than that of a louse or a black beetle, less in fact because she's doing people actual harm. Do you know what happened the other day? She bit Lizaveta's finger. And she bit it. Look, almost had to be cut off. Of course she doesn't deserve to live. Mm. You are, that's nature. But the whole point is we must direct and correct the course of nature. Otherwise we'd drown in an ocean of prejudice, don't you see? Without that there'd never have been a single great man. Well, people talk about duty, conscience. What I want to know is what do we mean by them, eh? Uh, no, hold on a minute, there's something else I want to you ask you. You hang on a minute, if there's something you... I want to ask you. Well. 
You do all this talking, make all these fine speeches. You tell me, uh, would you kill the old woman yourself? No. Of course. <laughs> Nothing to do with me. I'm only arguing the justice of the case. <laughs> I think if you wouldn't do it yourself, there is no justice in it at all. Let's play another game. Well, that conversation certainly had a great influence on Raskolnikov and his subsequent conduct. But, of course, it also raises some broader questions about moral problems and uh, questions of some relevance to Kant's outlook. Now, I have with me today two philosophers with an interest in moral philosophy, and I'm going to ask them to discuss these matters. They're uh, Professor A. Phillips Griffiths of the University of Warwick and Professor Bernard Williams of King's College, Cambridge. I'd like to begin by um, coming straight to the relevance of this to uh, Kant's outlook, and perhaps I could ask you first of all, Griff, um, what do you think uh, Kant would have made of that scene if, uh, say, he'd, he'd been with us to see it, and uh, what he would have said to, um, to the student's argument about what was the right thing to do in this case? Well, Kant uh, claimed that anyone who was sufficiently in possession of his faculties to ask himself what it was right to do could find out by applying what he seemed to think was a not-too-difficult test uh, the first formulation of the categorical imperative, which is the supreme, for Kant, the supreme principle of morality, is act only on that maxim which could become by our own will a universal law of nature. So one has to ask, can I will that the maxim on which I'm acting should become a universal law of nature? Now, I take it that the, axim, the, the maxim uh, which the student uh, is proposing to act on, or as it turns out, not proposing to act on in the end, is um, in order to do good to others, to brighten other lives, I shall arbitrarily take the life of another. The question is whether one could will that that should become universally a maxim of all men's actions. And I think Kant would say, and I base this on what he says about other examples in the book, that if all men thought it permissible to take the life of another when they believed that this would be of some value to the welfare of others, uh, that this would lead to such a general state of insecurity uh, that in fact the general welfare would be harmed, not increased, and hence that the end of the maxim is in contradiction with what the result would be, so that it would be self-defeating. And hence it is contradictory to suppose a situation in which every man acted on this principle. Yes, so that, that gives us uh, apparently a rather sort of simple, straightforward test against which we can measure this argument and we find it doesn't mm. work, and that's that, we reject it. But presumably the situation isn't quite as simple as that, or is it? Well, I think there's obviously a great deal to be said for this Kantian formulation. The categorical imperative, which Griff has referred to, of course, when uh, stripped of its elaborate terminology really is the fundamentally the test how would it be if everybody were to do that or if everybody were to act mm -hmm. on that mm -hmm. principle is the idea isn't it and I think perhaps it's worth emphasizing um, and I think this is a very important point both in itself and in relation to the novel though I think we perhaps won't want to spend a lot of time on this today that it's absolutely essential to Kant's test as it is to a lot of our moral reasoning and after all he thought his test was implicit in our ordinary moral reasoning, or in a lot of it, that the consequences don't have to be actual ones. That is, that when we ask the question, how would it be if everybody did that, it's not appropriate to answer, on Kant's view, but they're not going to. Indeed. It, the purely imagined test of everybody doing it is enough. And I think that's a frankly important point about Kant's picture of our moral outlook. And of course, it is rather different from Raskolnikov's position because Raskolnikov thinks he has a special insight such that the fact that other people aren't going to do it just shows their limitations, their blindness and so on. So for him, they aren't, they aren't going to do it 
is in fact a relevant consideration. But perhaps we'll leave that on one side and confine ourselves, shall we, to Kant's mm -hmm. test. How would it be if everybody did it, even if they are not going to? Okay. Now, well, the thing I first want to add to what Griff said, which I agree with, is that certainly is an exposition of Kant's outlook, is that the facts you have to appeal to in order to show that something pretty dreadful would follow from universalizing this maxim, supposing that everybody acted like this, depend only on some very general features of human action. Namely, first, that we have limited information, we all make mistakes and don't know what we're doing uh, quite often, and secondly, that we are in various ways biased, have special affections, have special concerns, and so on. You see, this man set himself up as the executioner in the name of justice of this old woman. Really, that's what he's claiming to be. But, you know, he's, first of all, his knowledge of all such situations is enormously limited. And secondly, he has particular reasons for hating this old woman, and we gather, to some extent, being fond of her sister. Now, if you were to, this is Kant's point, if you were to generalize this practice, you'd have absolutely everybody setting themselves up as judges of justice and who should be wiped out for the sake of what, and the result would obviously be a collapse totally of the social and moral fabric. I take it that's the, yes, the idea, isn't it? Mm. So where does this leave us exactly with, with regard to Kant's position? I mean, does, does, Kant have a, a moral, does Kant's moral outlook have some application here, or are we left no better than we would have been? <laughs> Can I make one remark? Sorry, I, I was going on a bit, but I'd I, I like to know very much Griff's reaction to that. I mean, I think that what one's just said, what we've both said, is perfectly reasonable. I mean, there the clearly is some force in the point of saying, if everybody acted on that principle of setting themselves up as unique judges, special judges of the justice and so on, and acting as executioners, you know, everything would fall to bits. I think that's, that is a powerful point. But there's some sense, I think, in which one feels that... Um, it in a way misses the depth of this question because the thing that frightens one about that student isn't that he's reached the wrong answer it seems to me but that somehow he's embarked on the question hmm. and that's what i think frightened dostoevsky that it was the idea that people were prepared to consider the idea hmm. of wiping people out in order to forward utilitarian aims making things better that really that ought to have been stopped before and even got going that is, that that shouldn't be a subject for discussion, such a project. And I think, in a way, Kant would not totally have disagreed with that either. Well, what do you fact, think about his, that? His, mm. his second formulation of the categorical yeah. imperative, treat humanity in your own person and in that of others always as an end and never as a mere means, uh, emphasizes the unconditional, absolute value of the individual, mm. uh, so much so that it is never right to hurt or harm and certainly not kill another individual for the sake of any other, that is to say, for the sake of any purpose outside that individual. Hence, to consider whether one may have purposes with regard to the young or to the sister, uh, which would justify hurting, harming, or killing the old woman, is ruled out of court immediately on the basic principle of morality for Kant. Yes, so what we have here is, is a balance of two considerations, one of which is, uh, is uh, the life of the old woman, and the other is the, uh, the benefit of the... Uh, that yes, could of be achieved by the Kant. money and so on. But for Kant, these are not commensurate. No. One yeah, of them has an absolute unconditioned value yes, uh, and against which the other can't be uh, uh, set, uh, set against. That's right. I mean, Kant, of course, regarded it as a duty to consider the interests of others and to further them. But for him, it was an imperfect duty. That is to say, in general, one ought to have such a policy. But an imperfect duty is overridden by a perfect duty. It is never right to kill for the sake of benefit to others. Yes. So an yes. imperfect duty, that's a, that's a term of art in the yes. Kantian moral philosophy, is it? Well, th that means something that it's in general required of one that one should where possible advance. Yes. But a strict duty is something which is an absolute obligation in the particular case, the particular case. to do or not to yes. do. So in the present case we'd have a conflict between, you mean the perfect duty in this rather odd terminology, which is never to kill anybody, or at least in such never to kill anyone for the sake of yeah, benefiting better, others. We'd better come back to that, I think. Um, uh, as against the very general, what's called imperfect duty of, as it were, pushing along the boat of human satisfaction or utility. And, um, as Ozzy put it just now, these aren't actually meant to be put into the scales against one another. And for a Kantian, the great sin of utilitarianism 
is that it's always prepared to weigh anything against anything. Yes. I mean, it, make me an offer is the mm. fundamental maxim mm. of, <laughs> indeed, a lot of moral mm. consciousness, but not for Kant. That's the point. You've got to say it's ruled out from the beginning. That's the. But now, you see, what I'm unclear about now, if for Kant, is what exactly is ruled out. It's, it sounded from your exposition, I think it is the exposition of Kant's doctrine about treating people as ends and never, as he puts it, merely as means, is that you can't, for instance, bump somebody off to forward some other cause or to satisfy some other duty, is that right? But what about situations, I mean, isn't that, might be thought, rather a pious and pure doctrine, because in fact there are circumstances, aren't there, in which people just are faced with choices of sacrificing the life of one lot of people or indeed bringing about the death of one lot of people in order to avoid, yes, as they suppose, yes. some larger evil. I don't, this I don't is something that I wanted to bring in to, to, to broaden this thing out a bit because we seem to be agreed generally on the uh, Raskolnikov case and on the unacceptability of the conclusion, but of course um, um, looking around the world today and so on, we, we can see that there are uh, people resorting to violence because they want to change things that they consider are wrong in their society. Now, in a way, that's what the student um, in the scene there was proposing to do. He saw certain evils and he thought it morally right that he should um, resort to violence to rectify things as he saw it. Uh, now, there are people around the world today, terrorists and, and uh, guerrilla fighters and such like, um, we don't have to look far, for example. Some of them we sympathize with, and I suppose some of them we don't. Um, but how exactly do we decide? Does, does the Kantian type of approach give us some insight here about who is right in resorting to violence and who isn't? Well, it seems to me that, the, as, as Bernard said, the Kantian position is a purist position, uh, and it has an immense appeal. Uh, the utilitarian position, as you say, is make me an offer, and you can balance anything against anything. But it seems to me that the, I don't, Kant talks about the ordinary moral consciousness, but a quite common human view is that the kind of calculation which the student engaged in uh, is tawdry and wrong, uh, but that the Kantian purism is impossible, and that perhaps it's a matter of scale. Where the stakes are high enough, when one's talking about the future of a whole society, or the welfare of a very large group, that at that point it is right, it can be right, indeed it can be a duty to engage in violence, violence which will in fact uh, dispose of the innocent, perhaps not as directly as he was prepared to kill the old woman, but with the same effect. Mm. Uh, now, um, uh, when you ask, does Kant help us in this dilemma, it seems to me that uh, what Bernard was saying in the beginning is right. In a way, it rules it out. The answer of Kant is you don't start that kind of calculation. Well, you've got to make a distinction here, haven't we? I mean, the, the, the point about uh, engaging in political violence, and I'm speaking now of violence done by the objectors to a state, not violence done by the state itself, um, is, of course, that it involves the death of the innocent. I mean, throwing bombs into pubs or burning down the hospital, or whatever it may be, to secure, as is supposed, some political end of justice and so on. Um, now, in the case we were given, of course, the student didn't represent the old lady as being an innocent party. No. There's some spectator, mm. uh, and he, mm. she was himself supposed to be the villain. So, as it were, the analogy to the political case between this case and a straight political case is not so much murdering the innocent in the cause it's supposed of justice, freedom and so forth, well, but as it were of tyrannicide. That's an interesting point. Of killing point. the unjust persons themselves. Sorry. That's an interesting point because, in a way, that puts the, the student in a stronger position, That's right. doesn't it? No, vis -vis. Kant would deny this because what oh. Kant would say is punishment is right, and if a person is immoral, then that person mm. ought to be punished. But that means you must not only act in accordance with the law, I mean, he would be, in a sense, punishing the old woman by killing her, and perhaps morally she deserves death. But he'd be acting in accordance with the law, but not out of reverence for the law, because his reason for killing her would be to get other people money, and possibly himself. Not simply that she should suffer um, uh, the, the amount of pain or harm which is appropriate to her immorality. But I think he's on stronger ground in, in the first sort of argument we considered. Both, you know, one's bound to say, who's the student to set himself up to, quote, punish mm. this particular person? And of course, it isn't punishment, I and mean, it's, just a, it's mm. just a private thing. Well, it's and of course the lady is in a sense though wicked or bad or horrible. She's not in the same position as some venomous ruler of a state. 
by any means. I mean, she is a citizen who's being as nasty as no doubt countless other citizens are being. Yes, we get back to our first argument. Uh, there, there is an yes. important difference between the two kinds of situations, but, I mean, w one does feel that, uh, at least in all one may feel mm. in certain cases, that there is justification for resorting to violence um, in, the, in the political situation. And I don't see why some of that uh, sympathy shouldn't uh, reflect back on the kind of uh, situation that the student was in, because although there is the difference between a political situation and a just uh, where one person was involved, nevertheless the student saw himself as writing a social <laughs> wrong. I mean, he, saw, he thought it was wrong that there should be all this wealth hoarded up by this whole hag and these other people go needy, and he thought that he ought to rectify well, this thing. I do think, honestly, that the, the, um, if we think it through more deeply, we find a great difference. It, it seems to me that the, the doctrine about where is just rebellion, to use a very old-fashioned phrase, that much truth was said about it in, for instance, by St. Thomas Aquinas. I mean, in, in the tradition where you say you resort to this only where the, art, where the, uh, the tyranny is of great severity, no other means are available to change it, and then what you, you know, the, 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 what you secure, the evils you do are not worse than what you're trying to prevent, and so on. Mm. Now, in the case of this old woman who's doing this, Many other means exist, if one takes it seriously, as a political act for stopping the things she's doing. And you get the sister to go away from her, you stop people going there to lend money and so on. Now, if you say, well, you can't stop money going, people going there to get money from her because they are poor, well, now you are touching on a genuine political issue, the inequalities in the society. This may point to political changes in the society. But knocking off one old woman because you happen to be fond of her sister is in fact, is not serious as an approach to a political revolt or a political issue. But, I mean... I, I'd like to ask you, you're saying, sorry, not serious, mm. and that brings me to the thing I wanted to raise about the, the last uh, bit in the scene there, and we'll have to be rather brief on this, but one thing I did want to ask you, at, at the end of the scene, the student, as you remember, backs away and says, no, I wouldn't actually do it myself, I was just theorizing. Now, is this in fact some sort of Kantian insight coming through, or is it a piece of moral cowardice on his part? I can't see how it's in any way a Kantian insight. Well, is he in some way seeing that after all, in spite of all his, uh, that his reasoning is superficial, and that it's undermined by the sort of Kantian consideration? There's no suggestion that the student sees that his reasoning is superficial. I think mm. that in the end he feels he can't do it. And I think we catch on here on the frightfully important point that probably what feelings people have about what they find tolerable or not may be a lot more important than the abstract moral reasonings they engage in to decide that issue. Mm. Would you agree with that? I think in general it's true. Mm. Uh, I wouldn't say that this means that one shouldn't engage in it. One should just do it better than the student does. Mm. So there is an important role for both of these things. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bernard Williams and A. Phillips Griffiths, for coming along and giving your views.